Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Sales. I'm Casey Jones. And I'm Ashley Early. And today we are going to be talking about um, a conversation or a topic that I don't think it's mentioned a lot in the sales community. It's what if you decide you don't want to be in sales anymore? Uh, I think this is actually really common. Uh, this is my story. I started my career in sales and then I realized marketing was a better fit for me. And I can talk a little bit about how I figured that out. But um, I also, I think that this is very uh, relevant, particularly for women. So Ashley and I have talked a bunch about the fact that when I look at the last sales team that I was on, I think there were maybe eight women on the team and only one of them is still in sales. Most have gone to marketing or people ops or recruiting. I think there's a couple of other uh, options in there, but it is really common. And I think it can be really tough when you're, Earlier in your career, um, your boss is probably not going to have this conversation with you. They're not going to help you figure out how to, how to leave their team. And most of the content and the information that is out there for sales professionals is really focused on uh, going from SDR to, to AE or getting a promotion in sales. We don't really talk about the fact that sales is a phenomenal career path to a ton of other options. And it's actually one of the reasons why I am so ridiculously passionate about the role of sales development in general. I kind of look at sales development as um, like the perfect entryway to a successful career in business because you learn a ton about business, about communication, about you know different roles in a company, different kinds of companies because you're talking to so many different people. So we are going to kind of talk through how do you figure out if um, sales isn't for you and what are you going to do about it? And I'll jump in and take, a, uh, take that even a step further. My specialty really is sales development work, inside sales, sales development teams, and especially people who are early in their career, helping them really launch it with the best chance of success possible. And I do that and all of my training and everything is geared, I tell them 20 to 30% of people who I have hired do not stay in sales and that's okay. So it's interesting too, um, you'll see more and more companies that will hire only if you're really interested and you know you want a career in sales long-term. I think that's silly in a million different ways because your sales team can be a bench for every other team in the organization and a good company will recognize that. I know people who have had successful sales careers of one year, two year, 10 years, decide to go into customer support, decide to go into product, decide to go into marketing, decide to go into literally every other department. I've seen salespeople go into engineering. Um, and it all starts with the skills that you learn as a sales rep. You learn to communicate, you learn to manage expectations, you learn the ins and outs, not just of your specific business, but the businesses of your customers. That insight is not possible in any other role in a company and is a huge advantage. Plus just straight up, the better you are at sales, the easier it is to get what you want out of life because everything is sales to a certain extent. So this is not something you should be ashamed of. This is not something you should feel self-conscious about. If anything, and I encourage everyone to go through this process that we're going to describe today at some point, the only way to know that you are in the right career is to make sure that you've looked at other options and that this is the one that you feel the most excited about. It's just like shopping for a product. You don't just look for, you don't just find one product and go, oh, this is the one for me. You evaluate other options. Your career should be exactly the same thing. Your career should be uh, a lot more thorough about that. Yeah, <laughs> Because much. it is the rest of your, it is the rest of your life. It is what you do, what you spend most of your time doing. Um, and I think, you know, Ashley's making an amazing point here is that sales is a, phenomenal training ground for pretty much any role. So, um, you know, I've had multiple conversations recently. I, I work with a lot of early stage founders and I've talked to multiple um, folks on the investment side that talk about how they love uh, founders that have experience in sales. Even if that winds up not being their core discipline later on, 
they know that that um, they're going to be better at pitching investors. They're going to be better about getting those initial customers. Um, they're going to be better at uh, communicating kind of the value of their business, understanding how it works, um, understanding the impact that it's going to have in other organizations and a whole host of other things. Um, there's also a lot, I think, to Ashley's point, there's a lot of value um, in product management. Yep. So just know that um, there's a ton of other options and sales is going to really set you up for success in a ton of those, which is really, really exciting. So, okay. So to get to the kind of meat of this, Casey, here are some of the things. I don't know what I want to do with my life. What should I do? Yeah. Well, so the biggest thing, look, this is the number one and this is... Um, in my view, it's kind of the most fun. It can be a little bit intimidating, but it's time to just start having a lot of conversations. So my recommendation always, and I think this is the best place to start. And frankly, well, it's, it's to, to have coffee or to have meetings with a ton of other departments. And here's the thing. I think this is um, what you should be doing as a sales professional in general. You should 100%. have a really good understanding of how your company works and what every department does. So hit up some people in product, in engineering, in marketing, in customer success, in customer support, in operations, in finance, and, and say, hey, can I take you to coffee for 30 minutes? I'd love to learn more about what you do. And you should do that just... One, as a, as a professional, you want to have that broader understanding. Two, as a sales professional. And three, as someone who is thinking about their future career. Um, it's quite interesting. I had a conversation recently um, with someone who uh, she wound up becoming a recruiter because she wound up totally by accident going to uh, uh, lunch with another person on the recruiting team. And they just started talking and the way she was talking about the work she did, she thought, oh my God, that sounds like what I want to do. And it wasn't, she didn't go out to lunch with this person thinking that that was it. She just knew that as an SDR, she didn't love some of what she was doing. She really wanted to be able to build like more uh, deeper relationships with the people that she was talking to. And she's been a recruiter for the last 10 years. Yeah. And so that this is a, just, I was gonna say that brings up an interesting question here. Cause you mentioned recruiting. There are certain other, a certain alternative career paths that have a lot of overlap and they're very easy transitions, both back oh, and so yeah. forth. So, yeah. I mean, off the top of my head, recruiting is one that comes up a lot. Pretty much every recruiter I know has been a salesperson at some point. And a lot of salespeople I know I've hired from recruiting. So there's a lot of cross-pollination there. Where else and is there recruiting, a of- Recruiting is sales. It, yeah, it's it just really you're, selling a, you're selling a job <laughs> instead of, a, instead of um, a product. I think the other one too is um, marketing. And it's not all kinds of marketing, but I know a ton of demand gen marketers. So the people that are the ones where it's, it's about filling pipeline um, that started their career in sales. I, that's my story. And, um, and I know a bunch of other people, there's a ton of overlap. And frankly, I can tell you, it is my biggest advantage as a marketer is that I started in sales because I use a ton of sales methodologies in how I feel pipeline for companies and for clients. And I talk to other marketers that like, they think that a bunch of the, <laughs> a bunch of the strategies that I use, they're like, oh my God, how did you ever come up with that? And I was like, oh, it's, it's like old hat in sales is boring in sales. It's really, really normal. Um, so I think that's, I think those are the two that immediately come to mind, but obviously anything that is in dealing with customers. So I think customer success, um, there's a lot as well. Um, Retention, little, renewal. Yeah. The other one that I've seen come up a lot, I've seen come up more in the past three, four years is operations and whether it's sales operations or company yeah. level operations, I'm seeing a lot more people who really thrive in the analytics. They yeah. really enjoy working smarter, not harder, making some really cool transitions. I actually um, know someone who created his own job from being an SDR intern Actually, in being an SDR intern, he found a gap in the customer support process 
that he was able to take the process that we were applying to inbound leads and applied it to inbound, basically support tickets, took that analysis and just on his spare time realized, oh, there's a huge gap and that correlates to satisfaction on tickets and basically created a customer support analyst role for himself when he got out of college. Like yeah. it was insane. No. And, he, it, and it wasn't, I mean, this wasn't, I mean, the kid's brilliant, but it wasn't like anything. He just thought to look and apply this stuff. So um, here's the other thing that I would say. And, and um, I think one of the key points here is also, you know, one of the strategies is to make sure you're having a lot of conversations with people that are willing to kind of advise you. And it could be your boss. Um, one of the, the big helps for me was I kept having conversations with my old boss, Casey Corrigan. Uh, and just, I kept saying, Hey, I like this about what I do. I hate this. What yeah. should I be thinking about? And so when this field marketing role came up, he, they were like, you know, they, they created this, this role. They, they didn't know who they should hire. And he happened to be in on the meeting and he said, Hey, I think this is, I think this would be a good fit for Casey. And they brought it to me and that was my entry point. So Talk make sure you're having a, having a sponsor. Exactly. And so make sure, and, and here's the big thing. If I had just had normal one-on-ones with him, I mean, I was really naive. I didn't, I didn't know that I was doing anything differently from my peers. I was constantly talking to him about what I liked about what I was doing and what I didn't and what I wanted to do more of and why. And so it made it really easy for him to kind of think of me when this came up. But if I had not been proactively like kind of being annoying with him about this in our one-on-ones, he would have had no idea and I never would have gotten that job. So I think that's the other key thing is find finding ways to be really honest with the people that you respect and that you admire and that, and that advise you because they're going to see things and hear about things that you're not going to have access to. And that's going to really help you down the line. One thing I think it's worth mentioning here, completely agree with you. I've been on both sides of that situation, both giving advice and receiving it, but there are also a lot of situations where being that transparent with the person who signs your paycheck can backfire because it can make you look like a flight risk. So it's important to build that relationship, but it's also important to make sure you've got the trust in the person on the other side too, that there's an understanding, yeah. the spirit in which that conversation is happening. Because there are yeah, definitely but I also environments think... where people take that and they're like, oh, well, they're not sure they want to be in sales. So I'm not going to spend any time training this but person. Here's the, but here's the deal. Not once did I say, I'm not sure if I want to be in sales. What I would say is, hey, I really love this part of my job. I'm wondering how I can do more of it. It's not about, oh, I don't think I like my job or I'm not satisfied in my job or I don't want to do this. It was never, ever that. Good. It was, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, I like these aspects of my job. And so at the time, I was running a team who managed all the inbound I managed the inbound SDR team. So we managed all the inbound leads. And so I was partnering with marketing a ton. And so I just would say, hey, God, this has been so much fun. It's been really interesting to team up with marketing and strategize campaigns that help my team get more inbound leads. It's really cool. I'm wondering if there's other ways that I can do more of this to help my team. So it all comes down to your tone. And yeah, you got to be smart about who you trust in a workplace, but you have a lot more control over people's perception of you than I think we sometimes think. And so how you put, um, how you explain these kinds of um, considerations is really going to be the thing that um, uh, I think makes the difference. And so if you're leading with, I don't like this or I'm unhappy, that can have a negative thing. But if you're leading with, God, I love this part of the work that I do. How can I do more of it? It's, it's going to have a, it's going to have a good impact. Completely um, agree. Just the, calling it out quick. The other thing too, that I will say about um, uh, another thing you can try, and this isn't going to solve everything, but it really did help me is I would look into doing some of the sort of career and kind of personality assessments. I don't think that Myers-Briggs is going to tell you damn near anything, but, um, I'm a big, big, big believer in, um, Gallup Finder, Um, cause 
the thing with Myers Briggs is it, I don't care what your personality is. Any single one of those personalities can be good at sales. And so that's not going to tell you, oh, I shouldn't do this job. However, with Strengths Finder, so when, when I took it, I took it around the same time that I had applied for an account manager position and I didn't get it. And I was really bummed about it. And then I was looking at my Strengths Finder results and I realized that my top five strengths really had nothing to do with account management. Not really. And um, when the field marketing job came up, it was like, it played to my, my core strengths so perfectly. And so it made me feel a lot more confident when I was kind of taking the risk to make this big career jump and move to a totally different trajectory that I hadn't even known that I was interested in. No, and that totally makes sense. I, I'm a fan of Myers-Briggs for a lot of different reasons. I think it's a self personality test, but when you explain it with the, the strengths finder and the applying it to your job, because you're right, any personality type can be good at sales. 100% agree. Yeah. They will do sales differently, but they could all be wildly successful. But that is really interesting. And I, Casey and I have been talking off camera about getting me to take this test. So I will report back soon when I do and let you know what I think. But <laughs> it, it, these, any chance you get to have an external window onto yourself yeah. is, and get that kind of outrospection as it were is incredibly valuable. It's scary. And sometimes the results are really weird, but yeah. There's a ton to be learned from that. So any sort of chance that you can get, whether it's a strengths finder, whether there's, I mean, there's a bunch of like surveys you could have your friends do about yourself. There's a million different ways you can do something like this. Totally. Worth it. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the reason why I like the strengths finder ones and some of these other ones that like go really deep is they get really into like, they, they go deeper than just like, oh, I'm I, like my personality, like the personality ones, don't get me wrong, I think are like so entertaining and it's really interesting to hear what you've got. But I'll also say like Myers-Briggs, if I take it one day, I'm really close to the, the, the line on a bunch of them. So depending on the mood I'm in, I will get a complete... <laughs> It will get a completely different one. But the thing that I liked about this, it was just very helpful when I was, um, it helped me explain to other people what I was good at. And I just didn't know how to put it into words. And once I did, it made it a little bit easier for me when I was thinking about the next steps in my career to think about like, okay, does this play to my strengths or does it not? And so like, great example, I'm really, really low on woo. And woo is, are you really good at like going up to a stranger and starting a conversation and making them like you? I'm terrible at it. And um, it, it is not a strength of mine and it makes me feel very uncomfortable. So let me tell you, cold calling, you know, I went through a period when I was, when I was great at it, but it really sucks the life and the energy out of me in a way that it doesn't do that for other people. And so knowing those things about you can really help you be like, okay, do I want to keep doing a job that, that makes me have to do these things that like, I don't know, suck the lifeblood out of me or the things that really kind of feed me and play to the, my natural strengths. And I'll, I'll just put a quick call out there. If anyone is in the situation of Casey where you feel like cold calling drains you and it's really exhausting and you're in a job that requires it, DM me. I've got so many tips and tricks for surviving that when it comes to working harder and everything else like that to make sure that you survive it. But I mean, Casey's right. There are points where you want to make sure it's not just playing your strengths, but also that it's an, it's a position that challenges you and your weaknesses. Yeah. So that they don't stay weaknesses and they don't atrophy. So it's, it's fun to look at things, not just from the perspective of, okay, is this playing my strengths? Oh yeah, I'm going to kill it. But also, Ooh, and this is also going to help me with these gaps that I know that I have that I want to help shore up which can be yeah, super it, useful. It can, but I will also say you got to know there are certain there are certain things so I'm good at cold calling. Yeah. But it really really drains me. And so that's not something that I want to spend any I'm not going to invest any time in that because totally. it doesn't feed me and it's kind of a it's a it's a lost cause. And so well, the and other at, thing and that you're I at like, a, you're at a point now where there are better things that you can do with your time. Exactly. And there's the, it's the reason why I like the assessment UMAP, which is Gallup Strengths Finder, is part of it. But where they they make you go through and you list all of 
these, it, it lists all of these skills and you list ones that feed you and ones that drain you. And you'll realize that like, there are certain things you're good at, but they really make you miserable. <laughs> so how yeah. can you find ways to not have to use them? Right. And so it's, um, it's just being kind of self-aware and taking that kind of critical look, I think can be really helpful as you're just thinking about the kind of pathway that you want to go down. Love it. Um, so in that, uh, in that vein, and this isn't accessible for everybody, but you might want to try to find a career coach. Um, I've talked to a couple of different friends who, particularly when they were at kind of inflection points in their career, they worked with a career coach for like a month or two um, and invested in one, someone who could really help them think about, okay, what are their strengths and what are the various roles that play to those? And then also, not just that, but then how do you tell that story and how do you speak to those strengths when applying for that next job? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that can be really tough is if you decide that sales isn't for you, okay, figuring out A, what is, and then B, figuring out how you talk about why you're qualified to make that leap, that can be really tough. And so getting some outside consulting or some advice on how you can like craft a narrative around your past and your experience and why it makes sense for you to be making this change, I think can be super helpful. I think this is more for if you're a little bit more senior in your career, um, but it's definitely something to consider. It, it, you know, it really is. And there's a lot to be said for paid resources like that. Everything from someone who specializes in career coaching to even just talking it through with a profession, like even I know people who've gone through this stuff with their therapists, you know, so making sure you've got oh, yeah. support. And if you don't have access to that sort of a resource, that sort of a, you know, management coach or a just general career coach, this is another point where mentors can really come in. Totally. Where having a mentor and they can not only do it themselves, but they can recommend people to you and and I, that's how I've done it. I've been several points where I was trying to make a jump or trying to figure out how to sell things in an interview. I, I'm obviously still in sales and probably won't, probably won't leave. I think I'm stuck, but stuck in the best way possible. But, and I do this for people all the time. I always tell them, I will always take a conversation and totally. I'll give you as much as I can out of it. And most people I think are the same way. So networking and finding people who are both in sales and who are in where you think you want to go and asking them, how would you sell it? So doing kind of both sides. So talk to a salesperson and tell them, I'm looking at getting into X. Can you help me? You know, I, what they're really looking for are one, two, three qualifications and skills. Can you help me tell us, can you help me craft a story about how my time in sales can carry over and then do the same exercise with someone who's already in X, X category. So if you can find the career coach, it is totally worth it. If you can't, don't freak out. You're still not alone. It just won't be and quite I, as structured. One, I think, I think you make a really good point. I think the key is find someone who made a similar transition yeah. and get their advice, right? Because they might be like, oh God, okay, here's one thing that I wish that I had done better, or I wish I'd learned this, or I learned this the hard way, or oh my, I lucked myself into this like situation. And someone who's gone, who's made a similar transition or um, who's hired someone who's yes. made a similar transition, that can be super, super helpful. And it requires talking to a lot of people because most of the time, once they've made that transition, you don't always know that story unless you know them personally. So start asking around. Um, and I agree with Ashley, like people are by and large really willing to help. And I will just say, if somebody send, if you send them a message and you say, I could use your advice and they write back and they're like, oh yeah. And then they ghost you. It's because they got busy. It's not because they're being mean. So yes. just follow up again. Um, this happens to me all the time. And I think then people think that I'm purposefully flaking on them. And it's like, no, I'm really accidentally flaking on you and lots of other things at the same time. So don't take it personally and <laughs> come remind me. And then I will be even more incentivized to help. 
Thank you for reminding me that I need to go clean out my LinkedIn inbox. So apologies oh, to God. any of you who may be in there. Yes. Um, okay. So the last thing that I recommend is taking what I refer to as a stair step approach. So um, you don't have to make a giant leap. Okay. You don't have to go from one career to some vastly different one. Figure out if there's some way that you can kind of test out a new role. Um, so if you are at a company where they are a little bit more open to these kind of lateral moves, be like, so like I mentioned, um, the nature of my job, I just started working with marketing and helping strategize marketing campaigns. And I realized, holy moly, I really like this. Or um, I remember there was a person that I worked with who he volunteered to the marketing team to start writing content because he was a great writer and he wanted to kind of test that out more. And he started just writing great content like for the sales team. And eventually he made the transition to marketing. So there's a, like a lot of ways that you can kind of test things mm -hmm. out a little bit. Um, so you don't, if you're not a hundred percent certain, I would find that, that pathway. Like I was talking to a friend who she has a friend who has decided he wants to get his master's in library science. And I was like, that's a really big jump that's to make, to go get a master's degree for a job that you're not going to make very much money and is actually fairly competitive because there's not a lot of those jobs out there. And I was like, maybe he should volunteer or like get a library assistant job for like 10 hours a week first before you go and like dive in head first. So Find, find ways to get a little bit of experience in the new role and to test it out, um, to really try it on because everything looks a whole lot more attractive when we're not doing it. You know, as you say that, um, it actually triggered a memory that I have. Um, I did this with sales operations. Um, early on in my sales, hey, to this day, I'm still consider myself very operationally fluent and very tech fluent when it comes to your CRMs and your sales engagements and all the happy fun tools that we use in sales. And there would have been a couple opportunities for me to move into a director of sales operations or, you know, that sort of a role. And the biggest reason I haven't done it was early on in my career, I was doing exactly this process. I was talking to different people in different departments. I was thinking, do I want to be an AE? Do I want to be a manager? Or, ooh, maybe I should look at sales ops because everyone keeps telling me I'm really good at this stuff. And apparently that's rare. And I sat in on two or three meetings and then I helped with an analysis of conversion rates or something like that. And I got like, I think I was allowed to do like 10 hours a week for a month. And just doing that one project, I got through it. I was good at it but those 10 hours were my least favorite hours of my week. And it turned into a, a project that I was happy to do. I was thrilled. I was challenged. But at the same time, I just like you with cold calling, it drained me. And it cemented for me that while I, I, I'm fine doing this stuff, I have no problem doing it. I'm great with it in small doses. I would go nuts if that was my all day, every day. So it can also, if I had jumped head first into a sales operations role, I willing to bet money, I would have flamed out within a couple months yeah. and been miserable. So and I it, think this it's is to the... save yourself from that stuff too. And asking to be involved in projects like that is a really good idea. And just mentioning too, if you are at all interested in content or writing or anything like that, or you think you have something to say. We are always soliciting content writers for the other side of sales blog. And we would love to help nurture and coach and just hear what you have to say. So please, 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 we have a content submission form on our website. Please reach out. We've got we've already gotten several people who have done so and we're super excited to work with them. But I will say we haven't had a lot of women reach out. We haven't had a lot of people of color or who are in the LGBTQ community. We want to work with everybody. But especially, I think Casey and I both have a little soft spot in our heart for women who have an idea of something they want to say, but don't know how to say it yet. So just a little thing on content creation there. Yes. Thank you for that plug. And I, like, I totally agree. Like, this is the, always the tough part in sales in general is you want the promotion, man. Yeah. 
Salespeople are competitive and we're driven and we're really excited to get to that next level. And sometimes you get so excited about the, shiny the offer for the next thing that you don't take the time to be like, wait, do I actually want this? And I think it's also, and I think we, we should do it for another episode is, do you want to be a manager? Yes. Because a lot of people t- take, they get the offer because they're really good at being an individual contributor. And it turns out the skills that make you really good as an IC are not the skills that make you really good as a manager. And um, it can be really hard to know that you want to turn that down um, or decide that you, that you want to take it. And so. Um, yeah, I'm going to need 30 minutes on that one. Cause oh, I got, minimum. I got thoughts. I got oh, thoughts I mean, I feel that. like that's, I feel like that's a, I feel like it's a whole series of episodes, Probably. honestly. Cause I think it's a, I think it's a really, really big topic um, yeah. for sales professionals and especially SDRs. Um, I think especially, so, I think especially if you are in that three to five year mark of yeah. being in sales, they are going to tap you for management at some point. It's just, it's going to happen unless you're actively telling people, please don't. Someone yeah. will tap you for management. It's just a question of when more than anything else. But that's yeah. really interesting. So summarizing, you're not sure you're exploring your options. You want to do your due diligence. Number one, talk to everybody. Have as many conversations you have. Ask them what their favorite part of their day is. Ask them what their least favorite part of their day is. Give yourself as much exposure as you can and see what gets you excited. Step two, take all the, assess- take all the tests and assessments and strength finders and everything else you can think of. Try and get that outward analysis on yourself. If nothing else, it's good for you developmentally if, and worst case, best case, it'll help you help make that decision a little bit easier where you should go next. Step three, keep talking to people, but this time maybe with some more structure. And then lastly, take a stair-step approach. Talk to other people, get some ideas about projects that you can do to really kind of dip your toe in the water. Make sure it's the right thing for you to do. I think the biggest thing listening to you give this list. Take your time. Do your research. Don't rush into anything. You've got the time to figure it out. Um, We don't want to rush into that next step in our career. Yes, you want to like, I don't know, seize the moment and all the rest. Um, But you've got, you know, take the time to really um, figure out what's going to be the right thing for you and, and, and put in that work to kind of figure it out. Well, like, and if I were to give a timetable, like I would say the coffee with people from all around your company, that could be a six month process. Totally. And you, you should know? do it when you get your job. I mean, this yes, should be you, an you, ongoing You start thing. it pretty much immediately and do like one a month. Totally. Do like one a yeah. month. Finding a career coach, that's weeks. You know, taking the stair step approach, that's a month or two. This is a long process. And the whole point is to give you information you need to make the best decision not to help you find the information once the decision's right in front of you. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have questions or if you want, uh, you need a sounding board, hit us up because we're more than happy to talk about these kinds of things. This is fun. This is fun it stuff. Because it's opportunity. Yeah. It is. It's exciting. See, where, see which way you're going. All right. Yeah. And with that... This has been another episode of The Other Side of Sales. Thank you so much for listening. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, review on your podcast platform of choice. We're also on YouTube if you'd love to see our smiling faces. Um, And here's what we ask you. Uh, Share an episode with at least one friend in sales. We'd love to grow our audience. We'd love to reach more of you. And we'd love to hear more from all of you on what would be interesting, what would be helpful. So when you, when this episode wraps, go find one person and and send them a link. That's brilliant. Look at, look at you with that guerrilla marketing, that lovely little marketing brain of yours. You know, you know, you know. (laughs) All right. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Don't forget to find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and othersideofsales.com. And with that, have a great weekend.